presentations. I know we said three presentations, uh, but unfortunately, some of our presenters couldn't make it. Um, there were some um, uh, difficulties with timing, and timing is a difficult issue uh, online and with different time zones. But welcome to all of you, uh, wherever and whenever you are, and we're hoping for a very, very interesting session. So what we're going to discuss today, I, said, I, I will welcome briefly, and then we will have paper presentations. They will be kept to uh, around four minutes each. Um, and then we have uh, plenty of time for discussion, um, uh, for plenum discussion. And as I said, we um, encourage everyone to uh, write in the chat whenever you uh, have a question or a comment. Um, we would prefer to, to use the chat because uh, you might have very different connections. And suddenly if people start to, to talk, um, apart from myself, uh, we'll, we'll get a disadvantage in who might be able to, to join the conversation. So please uh, stick stick to the chat so, so we have equal levels of participation. Uh, apart from me, who will be moderating the session, I, I will be allowed to, to, to speak. Uh, and I will also uh, reiterate some of the questions from the chat unless the presenters uh, picked up on them. But what we're about uh, here, uh, the, what we are uh, here for today is about uh, future sustainable development as a key for addressing uh, future problems. And several higher education institutions are aiming for more uh, sustainable development and how to build sustainability into education. So that is also what we're going to discuss today. But we're also going to discuss which approaches are fruitful for students and how should future assessment and settings be facilitated and performed. Um, so in this session, uh, we are taking point of departures in uh, papers addressing the educator's role or the institution's role uh, in, in, in relation to sustainability, elaborating on possibilities and challenges uh, for future sustainable education. Um, so what we're going to, to discuss today, for instance, could be how should sustainability be facilitated and assessed in the future and built into education. Um, so, uh, as I said before, just before I, I introduce the first presenter, um, you're welcome to write your com questions and comments in the chat room. Um, yes, so I think that was the introduction from me. Um, and now I would like to introduce the uh, first presenter, uh, which will be Shannon Chance. Um, um, uh, and, and it's a paper that's co-authored um, uh, with Carlos, Efren Mora, and I'm sorry about the names. I try to pronounce them as well as I can, but Ines Diraito, Maria Dolores Morera, Lastinia Hernandez Zamora, and Bill Williams. And I'm not sure how many of you are here, but at least we have Shannon here. And, and Shannon will be playing a video, but also Shannon uh, asked for just, just to have, have this, some time to contextualize the video presentation. So please, Shannon, I call upon you and uh, uh, Hope to see your presentation. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, Carlos is the main driver of this, and he's in the Canary Islands. He secured a grant to offer a program. His, his university teaches in a very traditional way, and he's trying to equip people to move more into problem based learning. So, this grant was to do problem based learning in an extracurricular format with students, but have graduate students and staff learn to facilitate PBL. So he's prepared a video for us about that project. And I can tell you more about the details about how it's gone after Ida plays it for us. Ida. This is not just about talking of integrating the sustainable development goals into the curriculum. This is about Ida, we're not saying the right thing. making our students less accommodated. We're not, we're not seeing the video there. Of large this is not just about talking of integrating the sustainable development goals into the curriculum. This is about changing minds and making our students less accommodated and more critical. 
higher education institutions are becoming more conscious about this need, but the inertia of large universities might fight against the pragmatism needed by sustainability. We all want to push students to take action now for a better world for all, but not just because it is the right moment, but because it's getting late. The rising question here is, how? We developed this program to attract and prepare our students to face sustainable development goals for active learning, but without the need of changing the curriculum. This gave us the opportunity of making Ingenia transversal and open focus, given that it is not linked to a specific degree, course or problem. Although it is true that youngsters can be quite non-conformists, this has not that much value when naiveness comes into the scene. The program could not be just supported by the intentions of our students to change our world. And this is why Ingenia had to go further to be successful. But what is Ingenia? It is a funding program for students wanting to take action and change the world. The program is not restricted to undergraduate students, but high and vocational school students are allowed to participate with some restrictions. In a nutshell, it is a program to educate change makers. To be successful, the program had to consider these four aspects, showing students what makes a program relevant, giving insight in how to propose the best and most sustainable solution, helping them to build and test a prototype to get real data and experience, and supporting successful teams to go even further. Ingenia supported these four aspects through three stages. First, informed potential undergraduate students about the program and offered them free training to prepare competitive proposals. At the same time, academic staff was informed and invited to participate as mentors. The role of mentors was helping students in writing credible and winning proposals, assuming financial responsibility and act as guarantors if they proposal was selected to be funded. Second, the program included the enrollment and training of postgraduate and doctoral students to participate as facilitators. And third, a committee of experts evaluated each proposal by assessing the feasibility, impact and sustainability of a team's proposed solution in addition to interdisciplinary, equality and proper formatting. Thirteen proposals resulted accepted, but twelve accepted the contract. All of the teams that signed the contract developed and got presented their solutions and results in a dissemination event. Currently, teams are in the process of finding additional funding for their projects. Some of them are trying with crowdfunding, others are trying to find a suitable public call and others are looking for private funding. Some of them will success, others will not. But this is part of our change makers process, isn't it? We are starting a second edition in 2021. We learned during the first edition, but we want to learn more and share during our planning discussion. Thank you. So I'm happy to take questions about the program either now or after the other presentation. Yes, I think uh, we usually have it. So we, we have the um, presentations following one another and then we have a plenum uh, uh, discussion. Okay. Yeah. So, but please, uh, I encourage everyone to, to post um, questions in the chat during the presentation so we can pick up on the questions afterwards. But uh, for now, I would uh, like to invite um, the next uh, speaker. Uh, Jede Elon Holger, who will present on behalf of Carla Schmink, Aida Gera, uh, who is uh, here, and Jeannie Savan Miklas, uh, who is not here, unfortunately. Jede? Thank you very much, um, Thomas. Um, and I hope you can all see my slides now. Is it? Oh, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, yes, uh, we have a paper here on. Uh, staff resources for sustainable development. It has been something that we have been doing in our center uh, 
our UNESCO Center for Problem-Based Learning in, in our university. Uh, and we have been developing uh, these resources over the, the last couple of years, starting with workshops in different disciplines and moving along with a more uh, comprehensive framework. So, um, and I will now go to the, the platform and I will tell you that this uh, platform has been inspired by uh, three dimensions of uh, Education for Sustainable Development, ESD. And the, the idea is actually that, that these three dimensions, of course, we have been inspired by uh, ESD theory, but basically, really, it, it's mostly by experience uh, for a lot of years where we have had these bottom-up uh, um, initiatives at Oberg University to integrate sustainability uh, in our educations. Actually, when I started 25 years ago uh, as a student in, in Alba University, the theme for all engineering students were sustainability. Um, and that was just in the area after um, um, all this initiating talk, and it was not as comprehensive as today, but still it has been going along for a long time, but um, on a more formal stage. We have defined these three dimensions, becoming aware, knowing more, and doing more. Becoming aware is about interrelating engineering and sustainability to really show students that this is important for them. They have to take responsibility by themselves and they have to see the point in doing so. So being aware of why they should engage is this, in this from a professional point of view also is very important. Knowing more is about expanding and qualifying what they know about sustainability, because sustainability is such a, a, a concept that you hear so much about that almost everyone thinks that they know about sustainability, and they do. But how much should you know in order to actually integrate it into your discipline? So knowing more is also a core value. And then doing more. Of course, uh, we also have to do something. It's, it's a matter of urgency. Um, so it's not about just becoming aware and knowing more. We have to actually uh, a brilliant opportunity to let our students engage and have a real impact on society uh, as is uh, by engaging them in uh, ESD projects. So these three dimensions has, has been the core because we cannot leave any one of them out. If, uh, if we leave out the becoming aware, we might bring some knowledge to, for the students, we might bring a project that they work on, but they will never go out integrated it in their uh, practice afterwards. If we leave out the knowing more, they would actually not have the, the skills in order to actually act in a proper way. They might come out with actually unsustainable project, even though they had the right intentions. And the doing more, we went for that, it's, it's about taking action. So in this considerations, we, we made this course and it's on uh, the center, the PB, Obo PBL Center website. You can see Annette here um, introducing our course. Um, and the first part is really the point in having this introduction is, is stating that this is just a platform for facilitating integration of sustainability for staff. It's not a standalone course. And this is very important um, that it's not enough, but it's a, a start and a framing. Um, then for becoming aware, we have uh, been, uh, we introduced this by inviting um, Professor Roger Hadgraf. With, and he's really stating why it is important as an engineer um, to address sustainability issues. So this is about coming from within the discipline and stating the importance of things. And then we uh, have some facilitating questions. We made templates in order for students to relate their discipline in accordance with uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, for every session, this is just the first one, we have wrap up questions uh, as we want to really stress the importance of reflections in, the, in staff and, and why they should actually consider this 
and how they can use it in their context, because the contextual part is very important. And there is useful literature, different links, and you will have an explanation of, of each of them. So you will know not only that the information is there, but actually how you can bring it into use. So knowing more, and here we have Carla um, in the middle of the picture, of the, uh, also here today and one of the co-authors. In knowing more, we actually start um, with having Ginny presenting what she actually has been doing um, to present sustainability from a more generic point of view. Not moving into details with one thing in, in specific, but having a generic approach. And then what we're doing uh, in, in our PBL approach is actually that we uh, say it's not enough to read literature, although we provide it here with guidance. You really have to, to interact with a uh, practical situation, with practice. Carla has uh, worked with uh, workshop settings together with different kinds of students, and she has shared uh, her uh, material uh, and uh, questions and cases for you to have some inspiration on that. And we also have a real life scenario, uh, the Sancho case, which actually also shows that you can use casework, you can use the possibility to set the students into a situation where he or she can make the same choice, facing the same dilemmas as if you are out there doing an engineering project for sustainability. Yet again, wrap up questions and literature and talks to dig in. And then finally, I have to, to look at the time and try to speed a little bit up. Uh, we have the doing more because of course we want our students to act. Uh, Ida uh, here, who's also here today and one of the co-authors present, why is it so important? And also, why can we use project work as a brilliant framing for letting our students act on sustainability issues? And we provide a concrete examples uh, from uh, computer science and electronics. Here, uh, associate professor Jens uh, Mio Pilsen presenting one of the projects where students actually go out in a different culture uh, working with waste problems. So yet again, wrap up questions and uh, links uh, of how to go further. And then questions for you. Um, because what I think could be very, very interesting to discuss and, and from our side get some uh, comments to is that this course does not teach sustainability. It frames education for sustainability. And I would like to hear about what do you see as the strength and the weaknesses in this particular approach? And also, it could be so nice to hear uh, your experiences about how you engage students in getting aware, knowing more, doing more. We just had one brilliant example of that, but maybe more um, examples uh, from, from all of you. And, and how does that really relate to what I've, I have just shown you? Could there be some interesting uh, collaboration in this concern? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jette, and also uh, Shannon and co-authors. So uh, now we have some time for discussion. There's already been uh, a lot of great exchanges in the chat, but I think I would like to return uh, to one question here um, um, to, from Anita Kolmos to Shannon and Jette. How do we build on the young students' concerns about the climate change? And I thought that would be an interesting question for, for both of you. So perhaps, Shannon, if you would like to start. Yeah, well, climate change is such a big abstract concept. In our particular project, we were um, not specifying the problem that we wanted them to work on. We were introducing the students to the SDGs, the various aspects of it and asking them to do something, to propose something that could have a positive impact locally, to do an action locally in the Canary Islands, in Tenerife, that would uh, benefit the community, but that would also support the SDGs. 
So we didn't frame it specifically around climate change, but you know, all the activities in the SDGs should be um, helping support positive impact on the environment. But you know, the whole thing was built to actually get them motivated. So that's very much what Yada was talking about. You know, not just giving them the content, but giving them the inspiration, the motivation to 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 get involved and to see that they can facilitate change. So the kickoff event that they had on the 31st of January this past year was about that. They brought in people who had facilitated change. They brought in people from Spanish-speaking countries, but uh, we, we selected people from Africa as well as Spain and, and um, people who could easily communicate with the students, but there were some really heartfelt stories about people who had facilitated change and who were young and um, you know, the students could look to them as examples. So we did in the end get 23 teams of students to submit proposals for uh, in the competition for funding. And um, then 12 of those got funded to take to the next step to do development. So they did their brainstorming at the beginning, justified why it needed to be done, how it would improve things there and how it ties to the SDGs. And then they got between 500 and 1500, um, your, uh, 1500 euros for going to the next phase of development. At this point, they're looking for even more money each from venture capitalists and the local government to, to implement on a bigger scale. But everything's been so much tougher because of COVID. Yetta or Annette? Um, yes, if I, I should supplement, I think, um, Sienna, what you mentioned is actually this uh, think global, act local. Uh, and I think climate change is a brilliant subject for that. Uh, and I, I totally agree, it's, it's broad. Um, what I think we can also use this uh, engagement from, from the young people to is actually to motivate our staff. Um, because uh, staff necessarily is not uh, so young and engaged uh, the, as our students. Uh, but I really think uh, that that this, and I've, I've been in, in dialogue in, in, for example, in our new uh, Over University strategy, the students are really pushing to get sustainability on the agenda. And, and therefore, the staff is also more, more motivated to do something and to integrate. And they, they actually have to say, yeah, yeah, my subject, my discipline is very important. But there's also some generic competences here that we have to, to take care of. And I think in that way, it's, it's a good um, motivation for staff. Thanks to both of you. I should say we have just been um, 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 married with another session. Um, Christina Lustrum and Ron Olset has, have, have also joined us. Um, they came from another session um, and were also presenting. So, so perhaps uh, the, the two of you could just briefly say what, 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 what your theme was in, in, in that session. And if, if you would start, Ronald. Uh, well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I was the moderator. And unfortunately, this morning uh, we had three, uh, we only had one of our presenters show up. And so we ask permission to join here. So if, if at some point, uh, Thomas, you can have a, a natural uh, inclusion, we'd like to have our presenter give her paper and maybe join uh, the discussion. It doesn't have to be this instant. If you wanna continue what's naturally going and, and maybe fit us in as time goes on, might that work? Yes, and sorry, Ron, for suggesting you were the author. <laughs> um, okay. I think it would be it would be very good to to, um, to 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 before we go too much into the discussions to have the extra uh, presentation now. So let's let's improvise. It's it's Christina who will present. Is that correct, Christina? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome, and and uh, I hope you're all happy with this improvised uh, presentation. We'll just get more, in, and we were supposed to have a third presenter. Now we have a third presenter. Yeah. So so <laughs> over to you, Christina. <laughs> much funnier. To to present with a little bit of an audience so i'm happy to be here instead okay so thank you for bringing us in 
Uh, I will uh, present a paper uh, quartered with uh, Guna and Sara. Uh, Sara is not able to join us today, but Guna also joined in the session. Uh, and our paper focused on the experience and reflections of implementing European teaching methods in five African universities. And the three of us are part of a EU Erasmus Plus project, Enhancing Entrepreneurship, Innovation and Sustainability in Higher Education in Africa. So uh, our perspective in this paper is primarily a teacher perspective while acting as trainers for colleagues from our partner universities in the project. Uh, the partners in the project are from five universities in Tanzania and Ghana and five European universities. The project is designed to reform the five higher education study programs, uh, which should be aligned with local, national and regional needs and priorities. The reflections will focus on internal and external opportunities and obstacles that we discovered during the first educational part of the project. Uh, in many parts of Africa, unemployment is high, even though uh, among young people who have a higher degree in, edu uh, in higher ed education. And hence to be entrepreneurial, find solutions to local problems and needs and think outside uh, the box and also think about sustainability at the same time is it necessary to uh, continue development in these regions. Our training approach in this uh, project uh, was conducted according to the following. Uh, in the initial stage of the project, uh, we follow, we're following a jigsaw puzzle model. Uh, there were four training areas, uh, and they are student-centered learning, entrepreneurship in, and innovation, e-learning and sustainability. These areas were trained in three workshops, two which was conducted in Europe and the third in uh, the African Home University. Then the trainees from the African universities eventually trained their colleagues uh, at home. With regard to the pedagogical approach, two student-centered learning approaches was implemented uh, in the training, uh, and that was problem-based learning and challenge-driven education. In the training process, we met uh, several challenges related to uh, concept and context disparities. For example, uh, European context of teaching uh, is aimed at training for uh, opportunity-based entrepreneurship. In the African context, entrepreneurship is primarily necessity-based and a common source of self-employment. Furthermore, our African project partners lack infrastructure facilities like innovation centers, incubators, and support from organizations uh, in their home countries. Coming from KTH Stockholm and, for example, visiting our innovation uh, hubs and uh, incubators provide participate, participants with unique experiences and motivation. However, more importantly, it helps our trainees to sharpen their arguments when working and to improve their infrastructure and institutional conditions in their context. Uh, it's been very valuable for the participating African universities to exchange knowledge and experience internally between them. Uh, however, an external obstacle is, of course, that the communication tools like Skype and Zoom and that we take for granted works well in the, our context does not work very well in Africa. Another issue is uh, that it's very important to understand the cultural context for uh, learning. Students in Africa have more responsibilities at home to take care of their family, helping parents to meet the basic requirements uh, for their livelihood like food, water and taking care of siblings. It was important for trainees to come to our European universities to get a better understanding of the cultural and institutional context of our training methods and approaches. And this understanding also helps uh, from both sides uh, and our experiences that, that are necessary to see and experience firsthand even if it generates a number of travels between Europe and Africa, which uh, is very bad, of course, from a sustainability perspective. In our part of countries, the education sector is working uh, more independently from industry, involving stakeholders in the project on a voluntary basis turned out to be very difficult. In order to actively involve stakeholders, uh, you might have to introduce pecuniary returns uh, to uh, uh, get people to uh, be involved in the projects. Yes. 
Uh, when we entered the project as trainers, we had little knowledge about the other areas of training. We were not jigsawed ourselves as trainers, and this might influence the fit, sharpness, and subsequent alignment of the jigsaw technique pieces that we delivered in the project. Uh, we think that this is an interesting issue to discuss with you. Uh, to what extent uh, we as teacher in a, uh, such a jigsaw model uh, needs to be jigsaw trained ourselves in order to make sure that the pieces of the puzzle fit together in the end. So that was uh, our thoughts and reflections. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, what an absolutely uh, wonderful addition to, to the uh, other presentations. Um, there, there was one point that I was a bit unsure about, Christina, if you could uh, elaborate on a thought that was interesting. Um, mm -hmm opportunity versus versus necessity driven mm. uh, motivation could, could you say a little bit more about that i thought that might be interesting also in terms of, of, of sustainability mm. surely uh, uh, the thing is uh, as a entrepreneurship researcher and educator we talk, distinguish between the motives behind uh, be deciding to become an entrepreneur whether you are doing it uh, to make, uh, I mean, to find ways to make a living, so to say, uh, that it's kind of your basic needs for the day that drives your entrepreneurial activities. In a country like Sweden and Denmark, uh, we have very low uh, levels of uh, what we call necessity-based entrepreneurship because we have a social security and institutions that make sure that even if we lose our job, we will have uh, the state to take care of us and uh, provide us with unemployment benefits and so on. So uh, in the case of Sweden, for example, 90% uh, of the entrepreneurial activities uh, uh, targeted towards opportunity-based entrepreneurship. That is to uh, explore an idea uh, that you find a solution uh, to some problem in the market which you think uh, is needed. So it's uh, targeted towards not... Uh, uh, surviving for the day, so to say, rather to explore an opportunity that you would like to elaborate. And of course, the situation in the African countries is more or less completely the op opposite. And that also uh, influence, I mean, what, uh, that's why we say it's a context disparity, because uh, when they talk about entrepreneurship, it's, it's to make a living uh, and to, you know, survive for the day that they are thinking about uh, Whereas when I teach entrepreneurship at KTH in Stockholm, it's how to uh, explore markets and find uh, uh, solutions for uh, scaling up and things like that. Um, so it's a completely different environment that we teach for. And I was just wondering whether uh, Shannon and Jede have something to, to, to comment on in, in relation to that and, and sustainability in education. Yara, do you want to answer? Well, I think it's it's a very good point because it's this. Um, you can say whether it's a necessity or an opportunity, but and and the differences in the local sustainability problems. I think, Christina, it was very nice to see your pictures. You know, because it's a whole different uh, world out yeah. there. And and if we can, in 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 the in the sense that we can teach our students here in Denmark or in in, in a European context, uh, that there are other people who who doesn't see who see this as another kind of necessity, not a global. We have to act the the, the uh, but but something very local. It's an everyday need that we have to act now or else. I cannot cope for tomorrow. Uh, so this sense of urgency, which is so important in, 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 to integrate in our students' minds, um, have a whole other dimensions if you, you, if you go into cultural. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a very important uh, piece to the picture using your jigsaw um, pick, uh, type of uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. I would say that that was a huge motivator for participants in our program because one of the presenters at the kickoff day talked about work with homeless people and um, some specific interactions and how meaningful they had been. And 
so the audience broke down in tears. You know, it was just kind of this uh, visceral, really human, empathetic approach to um, inspiring people to get involved. You know, we, we have all these data. They're doing nothing to inspire people to change. So this was an effective example of showing how people who are living in that day-to-day -day kind of existence, just a reminder that they're right next to us. They're, they're not all far away, that many of them are close enough that we can affect their lives and our lives too. Maybe that's a piece that's missing in a lot of our education. And as I was commenting in my comment box that, you know, I use this three-pronged kind of model that um, Yetta was uh, presenting. I've used it for decades teaching sustainability to architecture students. So in their support course, trying to teach them knowledge, skills, and values, you know, to, to spur them to want to do something different and then apply all that in their design studio. Um, but my focus wasn't really on um, necessarily uh, pushing them to become advocate uh, activists. Um, but it, it did work out because over the years, more and more of them adopted those topics for their fifth year thesis, um, adopted sustainability and community design topics. So it, it was successful in motivating them, even though it wasn't as explicit as it is in these programs that you're, that you're describing and that I presented from Carlos. Yes, and uh, thank you very much. Um, and Annette is asking, uh, the European students are very concerned about climate change. Is this the case also for, for, for students in Africa or are priorities different? Maybe that's for you, Christina, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, taking that to Guna, I think, uh, who was yeah. part of the sustainability team. Uh, my spontaneous answer would be, yeah, it's the necessity-based entrepreneurship is prior yeah. one in relation to sustainability, to be honest. But maybe you want to elaborate on that, Guna. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I completely agree with Christina that uh, the priority might be a little different as we have explained about uh, the necessity and the priorities for their day-to-day -day life, uh, what they would like to do in that perspectives. So even though we teach a lot of sustainability and climate change in our tower universities, of course, they are talking about the sustainability and climate change, but uh, I'm not sure that how much they have integrated into their systems yet because the priority is very different right now for them. So what we are trying to see here are, as Christina pointed out is like uh, how they can um, integrate their um, uh, stakeholders into their education program to improve their um, uh, curriculum and to, in order to reach their uh, things maybe for the future education program at the university level. So the curriculum development is one of the things that we have been discussing in this uh, project as well. So probably we try to integrate somehow to bring them in their system, but it is like uh, the hierarchy is very different and uh, the targets are very different in African perspectives. Yeah, on a personal note, uh, I'm, uh, I told you Ron before that this was the first time I was participating in a project like this and uh, uh, following up on the note on uh, that it's actually very necessary to go there and see. Uh, the first workshop I had in Stockholm before uh, having ever been in any of these countries before. Uh, so uh, probably the training was not really addressing the right stuff because I didn't have the right pre-knowledge about the situation. And of course, I wouldn't say that after coming once or twice during the project, I know uh, every something at all, but at least a little bit more about uh, these things, about the, the difficulties and the differences between opportunities and necessity-based entrepreneurship in their context. So uh, I, I, it's been, uh, you know, uh, really mind-changing for me as a person also to come there and see uh, what this means in reality in, in uh, these locations. That's 
that's for sure. Uh, to add on that, with my experience, I have been uh, working with African students because we had a lot of bilateral programs and we had like MFA study program that we are sending master students from Sweden or from Stockholm to Africa to do their project work. So just to explore their ideas and what is there in reality. Uh, say, for example, the lab facilities which we are providing at the students here is very different from what you get there in Africa uh, if they are going to do a project work and so on. So it's a very big uh, differences there. Just to get the basic things to do the lab work is uh, really a big challenge for them. So, so there are a lot of uh, differences in this uh, context, I would say. But we have been discussing sustainability and um, uh, climate change in a project perspectives, but uh, with the education value, I don't know how far it has been integrated. So that's uh, more things that we need to uh, discuss in detail. Thank you very much. In my perspectives. <laughs> I, 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 I'll add something on this topic. It's only tangentially on this topic, but it does have to do with moving people from focusing on the immediate necessity to the greater good and inspiring them. Um, this project was, the Ingenia project is situated in an institution that's very traditional based. And Carlos is one of the people in engineering who wants to change things and get people to use more project-based, problem-based learning. But they don't necessarily have the facilities. They, they don't have the, the staffing timetabling to do that. Yeah. So he needs to convince the faculty, the, the other teachers to do this and help them learn how. So um, at one point he got some, some time or for, for a while he got people to volunteer some hours to help facilitate and learn to facilitate project-based learning. Mm -hmm. But this is a method to do it that he you know, was able to get some incentives to help inspire people and enable them to implement their ideas, but to get um, the teachers and postgraduate students more and more familiar with how to facilitate problem-based learning. And he in the past had set up a program um, after the volunteer hours worked out from the, dried up from the, from the staff, he got students who had been through project-based learning in their third year to facilitate it for the first year students. So he's gotten really good at um, making a pipeline of students who are familiar with project and problem-based learning and providing training to them and um, helping them conduct that with some, with some supports so that they can help shift the culture, you know? So instead of just what lecture do I have to go to next? What lecture do I have to deliver to my students? What content to just slowly change the, change the culture. But this was a really highly visible way that people really wanted to do because there was a lot of um, glitz, glamor and funding involved with it. And it was a lot like a shark tank kind of venture capitalist experience. So um, all different kinds of incentives to get people to want to do something out of the ordinary that's not just solving their immediate day-to-day -day problems. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And and so, sorry, Gunnar, for not for, for not introducing you earlier on. I, I was a bit unsure who the two presenters were. So, uh, <laughs> my apologies. No, um, no <laughs> what, what one thing I, I I gathered from 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 the talks here is the. Um, uh, necessity of, of students also experiencing uh, these things. And um, now we've just been in a situation where it's difficult to experience things. And uh, realistically, we can't uh, uh, fly back and forth students between uh, Europe and, and African countries, for instance. So, so do you see ways in which we can use technology, project-based learning, to make students more uh, aware of, of, of um, issues like this that, that within sustainability? Yes, I think uh, uh, just to add on that, I would like to comment uh, from KTH, we are having this global development hub program and uh, the challenge driven education. So we keep that as like a case study with African universities and uh, the KTH is working more on these aspects, especially the global development hub uh, that to connect these African students with the, you know, who are studying uh, masters at the universities to do the projects. 
on a challenge driven education and so on. Uh, would you like to add anything, Christina, in these perspectives? <laughs> uh, I mean, the technology is still, of course, uh, a difficulty, but uh, as part of this project, uh, I think um, uh, we have also supported with uh, video equipment and uh, enhancing the technological and infrastructure level. So once you have at least stepped over a certain milestone there and also uh, built the personal networks uh, that we got with having these workshops together, I think the step towards continuing working to the, together digitally uh, is much easier. Of course, we all know that uh, there are things that we uh, uh, really need to see each other face to face to be able to solve. But uh, once we already know each other from the beginning of the project, uh, things are easier to handle digitally also in, a, in the current situation. But uh, yeah, that's just my comment. Yeri, would you have some, some comments also? Um... I just want to, to change the, the, maybe a little bit to, to ask something, because I, I would like to ask, now we have a, a presentation on, on these online resources, and I just put a link um, in, in the chat. And, and what I was thinking, sitting here reflecting on is, what if we use these online resources, which is, is pro provided rather ge generic, to, to talk about different kind of training across cultures. So if we use the online and the technology part in that sense to, to, to make uh, teacher groups across cultures to exchange different kind of cases and so. I don't know whether there would be an interest for that, um, but I think at least um, we go out, each of one of us, uh, Christina said with, with her perspective and finding, oh, this might not actually be the, the right things to address in this huge sustainability um, subject. And maybe we could kind of find a way that we could um, connect and, and uh, share our experiences with different cultures. Ida have in, in uh, also experience from different cultures. So, so I was just wondering whether that could be uh, interesting or uh, an, uh, an aspect to look more into. Yes, others are also asking to 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 ask questions, and and, and I hope you, you, you can use the chat, uh, Mohammed Sharifi, if, if if you'd like to 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 share something, you're very welcome. Um, yes, um, and I think it's interesting moving into uh, an area uh, that I'm keenly concerned with the, the online learning. And, and I'm just thinking whether there's an idea for project-based learning to think of how we can work with, with student groups that are not sitting in Denmark and Tanzania, but, but, but well, are sitting there physically, but are working together. Uh, and, and, and would that be possible? Is that a way to, to becoming more aware and more sensible to what other uh, people's challenges are? Do you, do you see that as a realistic uh, that we could make cross-country groups, for instance, work together on projects. Does anybody have experience of doing it digitally? Because I mean, I, I've certainly, I've brought students from the US to Tanzania to do urban design projects together, at least, you know, the conceptualization phase. But, um, and we, we still, that was 2005, um, my major program, we still communicate with each other um, and we still support each other's projects. But um, we met each other in person first, you know, and it's, it, it'd be really hard to connect with people who live in a, such a different place from you if you don't have the chance of riding the dala dala with them, of eating meals with them, you know, of really getting to know what their perspective looks like just a bit, you know? 
I'm not sure if anyone's been able to, to get those kind of co collaborative cross-cultural teams at doing projects. I mean, certainly in our institutions right now, we, we do have projects that are running, you know, with small groups of students. Our, our Common Core first year design projects at TU Dublin and our projects at UCL, they're all running project-based learning in teams on the screen and they do have international students, but still it's more, you know, taking the, the grounding of the place, you know, everyone adopting the culture of UCL or TU Dublin and, and trying to acclimate to that if they're still back home in Roscommon, you know, or in China and here taking a class. But I would like to say, I totally agree with you, Shannon, that it's, it's more difficult and, and context matters, getting a sense of, of being there is, is brilliant and, and is, is the most important thing. But if we, do not have the resources to send all students uh, around the world. Um, then I would say a, a next step could be to, to show them on the screen to, we have a master in problem-based learning, which is totally online, where we, we actually, we never meet, but we use other ways of connecting, uh, showing things online, uh, uh, telling story about who we are and so, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, cannot, and, and especially I would say in design, um, where you have so many tangible objects, it's very very hard. But but uh, but I think we should not. Um, we should take the opportunity to have more students have this intercultural experience, even though uh, they are not there. So. Um, An interesting part of that equation is the tools for collaborating in the design world are really quite developed. And so, um, you know, if the students are learning those technologies, it, you know, our industries have been <laughs> collaborating by, you know, tossing work from one group to the next around the globe for decades now. And the tools are quite sophisticated, but people need good, strong design skills um, <laughs> before they can just pass these objects around. Yes. And um, yes, I, I think this is very interesting uh, debate about the online and so on and, and something close to my heart. Uh, I'd, I'd have suggested we also start to, to move towards um, uh, final remarks, but also I should say uh, Mohamed uh, Sharifi wrote that he is from the University of Tehran and currently he has got the responsibility to initiate GBL at the university level. Um, and he's very much interested in, in getting experience and best practices. And, and, and so, so if people have some ideas for, for, for Mohammed to, to where to look, where to go and who to talk to, um, please use the chat. I, I think there are uh, amongst us, uh, there must be millions of, of interesting resources. I know the UNESCO uh, Center for PBL, OBO Center for PBL has some, some website on, on, um, and, and, and other resources, but, but, but could, I, could I encourage everyone to uh, uh, put into the chat resources and help for Mohammed. And I hope I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your, your, your name somewhat correctly. Right. It's so difficult. Cool. <sighs> Oh, and, and we're moving into uh, final uh, uh, comments. Uh, I, I, and I, am I supposed to say something here, Ida? <laughs> no. Um, well, I should say one 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 way to start, of course, is is to have uh, advertise a bit for our PBL Week 2021, which was supposed to be in 2020, but uh, COVID-19 and so on, you know. Um, but we do have a whole week of PBL. Uh, goodies um, coming up in August. Uh, there are two international conferences, the IIS PBL conferences, uh, of which this flipped uh, seminar is part of, and also the uh, PBL 21, 2021 international conference. So there are two, two different sessions. Other than that, uh, I, I think I'd also just like to hear if, if you have any uh, final comments, any of the presenters, uh, Yede, Shannon, uh, Christina, Gunnar, whether you have some, some 
very brief final words you'd like to share? Yara? No, I just want to say thank you very much, Bo, and it was very interesting to hear the other two papers. Um, hope to be collaborating with you in, in the future. So um, I think that was all for me. Thank you. And thanks to you at Alberg for putting this together and making a forum and an impetus for, to, for us to, to move away from our immediate concerns <laughs> and um, look at the big picture and the opportunities out there um, for sharing and working together. Thanks so much for inspiring us today. Kuna, Christina, any wrap up comments? Not really, thank you for uh, joining to this session. I think that uh, made a valuable contribution to the discussion of our paper. It would have been very lonely in uh, a session of our own and it fitted well into your current theme very well. So thank you for facilitating this. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much for a nice discussion. It was really great to hear from your perspectives. And so, yeah, yes. I have learned a lot today. <laughs> Thanks to all who participated, and I think this kind of format is also something we think about more in the future, even though we can visit each other, this might also be a way to getting to know more about each other's perspectives. So I think also, and I should say Ida is really uh, uh, the brain and hand behind many of these sessions. I have a whole manuscript. I'm not working on my own here. So uh, I, I hope very much uh, you've enjoyed the session and there will be future sessions. So, so keep an eye out for, for the upcoming sessions. Uh, there are already some at two o'clock. Now you don't have time to switch much to get coffee. So I better stop here now and uh, say goodbye and thank you all for participating. Thank you.